Showing on this episode of Law Weekly, we discuss mainstreaming gender issues, law and security. We have the views of the first female dean of the Faculty of Law, University of Lagos, Professor Choma Agomo. The Minister of Justice and the Attorney General of the Federation, Mr. Abuba Kamalami, is calling for unity irrespective of the challenges that have faced the country in recent times. We also have our recap of the top trending stories from the courtrooms. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Shola Shuyeli. My guest, Professor Choma Agomo, is the first female dean of the Faculty of Law, University of Lagos. On March 1st, 2021, she will bow out of the university as she retires after clocking 70. Several events have been lined up to herald a celebrated exit from the ivory tower after over 40 years of unblemished service as a foremost law teacher and expert. In this interview, I began by asking how this makes her feel after a career that saw her become not only the first female dean of law, but also the first female elected dean of a faculty since the establishment of the university in 1962. Fulfilled. I feel very happy. And I am very, very amazed at God's amazing grace because it's all been a work of grace in God all the way so I'm happy and I'm satisfied as a former Dean of Law and member of the Council of Legal Education are there any gaps in the training of lawyers in Nigeria in the light of new technologies virtual court proceedings etc can you share with us some of the gaps that you've identified um, it's hard to say that there are no gaps or that there are gaps I would say that Nigeria is also trying to measure up. For example, here in the University of Lagos, we have commenced lectures, but they are all virtual, including the Faculty of Law. In fact, the LLM at the master's program, the report I get that it's been a resounding success. So I would say that legal education is trying to pull its weight to follow up and meet up with the times. I have read that your secondary education was interrupted in your final year in 1967 by the Civil War. So in the light of Nigeria's current security challenges, do you think that there's any role for law in addressing this crisis? I think that's a million dollar question. My opinion is that you can make all the laws you like. It takes people. First of all, people make laws and people implement laws. So law is really a reflection of the people. And if nothing changes, if the mindset does not change, you can make all the laws you like. Nothing is going to change. Nigeria is what I would call an ethnocentric people. So it beclouds our judgment as to what makes for good law, good governance, and the welfare of the totality of the people. So law can only be a reflection of its people. And I would say men and women, people must first change. Before anything can change, we need to have a rethink. The mindset, we have to change. I know that you're also passionate about mainstreaming gender equality. How much progress would you say has been made in that direction? I think this is an area where we'll talk of maybe one small step forward. Maybe back. It's ding-dong affair. But one area uh, that maybe I would say that you can have or you can see the change is the area that women are now beginning to tell their story, not others telling it for them. In other words, this victim mentality, what they done to us. No, you take your future in your hands. You may have been a victim or victimized, but you now use it because you can get up and tell your story. And in telling your story, you get power, you get freedom, and your voice can be heard, and your voice resonates. So you find people, it connects. So to that extent, yes, there has been progress. But when you come to different areas, employment, governance, or whatever, I think it's tokenism. I think people still talk, but they don't follow with the talk. They don't follow through. So what has to give? What has to change? It still goes back to the issue of people need to 
change the way I think we must be ready to unlearn so we can relearn. In dealing with gender issues, we find that the iceberg concept is very true. That is submerged in our culture, in our religion, in socialization traditions. And people talk about them as if they are cast in stones. But they change. And so we need to change the way we think, the way we do things and see, like I say, every human as your equal. Men, women, see? we are all born equal before God. So to think that because you are born male, you have a superior, superior right over me, that's what you have been taught. That's what you've been socialized to come and believe. I think it's wrong, terribly, terribly wrong. The moment we begin to change it, you find that in fact, we've just changed ourselves and say, why did we remain in the dark ages for so long? We have so much to gain by working together as partners in progress. We need to come to that understanding that it's about us. It's about the community. It's about the nation. It's about everybody. It's about our well-being. Then I don't know, no longer see you as after all, you're just a wife. After all, you're just a girl. You're not supposed to do that. You hear that so much. A married woman. Does it define you? Very profound words there, Prof. I hear what you said about the need to unlearn and relearn. But what advice would you, would you give to young women, young professionals, a lot of who look up to you as a role model, as a mentor? It, how should they deal with discrimination on grounds of gender? Okay. Um, I say I'm a storyteller and anybody who comes to me I said you have become part of my story and I hope that I too have become part of your story. Now when I was dean of the faculty of, the of, faculty of law, one day I was in my office, a student of mine came in looking haggard, traumatized, everything. And then I asked, I said, what's the problem? Of course, it's a marital issue. Uh, her husband had two wives, and she had four girls, and so he had left her to her faith. She and her children, she was solely responsible for these children, and she was overwhelmed. But a colleague of mine, my very close friend, now took on one of her, her last child to stay with her, to help her to be able to concentrate. So when she came looking, like I said, the victim, the perfect victim, picture and I said to her just because you have been rejected is that why you should reject yourself and I said would you really have passed I have passed through that stage and if I can pass through that stage and I'm sitting here today why should you be different she looked at me and she pointed at me and started laughing hysterically so I was watching her then she left the office the next day, she came back, dressed up, neat, and I said, do you want to see me? She said, no, I just came to show myself. <laughs> wow. And I said, the last contact I had with her, she was doing her master's. There are many like that, people who come and say, do you know this man has not touched me, meaning husband, for the last two years. Do you know he picked another woman who is in this same place with me? I see her every day. And I said, well, we just have to move on. And years later, I see her. They are reconciled. She's happy and all that. The last I heard of her celebrating is 20 years of marriage. So you see people who, like I say, storytelling, the fact that something has happened to you does not mean that that thing defines you. In fact, that is a wake-up call. That's where you should build on it and say, so what? What next? What next? But if you think that your future depends on someone being accepted, being, then you'll be there. And at the end of the day, you'll be really the real victim, but victim of your own inactivity, of your own, what I call self-prison. Let's also talk about another of your passion. I know you're passionate about the practical application of human rights principles in the world of work. How has that journey been so far? Oh, it's one area where I will say 
Yes, I can see a lot of positive changes. I have worked closely with the National Industrial Court for almost three decades and I've seen the transformation that they are making. When we talk of the world of work or labor relations, we have two levels, the individual employment law and the collective employment law. I think we've had more, and that's where the human rights issue play out more, within the individual employment law area than the collective. Because before the National Industrial Court got its wider powers, the individual employment law cases went to the regular courts. And our law is based on English law that says freedom of contract, non-interference. Employer can hire and fire for any reason or for no reason. So you can do anything you like, you're just an object, as it were. It's no longer so. The ILO concept of decent work means that you have to, labor is not a commodity. The issue of uh, chapter 4 of our constitution or chapter 2 not being justiciable no longer applies because chapter 2 has been used by the National Industrial Court more than once to enforce the fundamental rights of workers. And with the phenomenal case, the land breaking case of uh, A.J. Kamado Council, the first case on sexual harassment where the judge used the constitution, CEDO, African a charter, mm -hmm. everything to rule on that case to establish sexual harassment. I would say, yes, I'm satisfied. But that does not mean that we have arrived at the post of no. Like the National Industrial Court, they had a workshop uh, last month and they asked me to come and share my thoughts, that passing, passing thoughts, where do I think it should be heading to? And as God will have it, even some judges of the Court of Appeal were there. And the Court of Appeal had just delivered a landmark decision. And I said, my fear had been that the Court of Appeal was likely to pull back the National Industrial Court. The uh, progress made was like it was in danger. But no, that decision was a refreshment. It was like a breath of fresh air saying, we recognize this court as a specialist court. They have areas, so we have to listen to them when issues like that come. That means. We have come a long way. And also is another decision of the National Industrial Court saying the common law rule that says you can't say an employee go back because it's in the private sector no longer applies. It doesn't mean it has become a general rule. But what it means is that private employment relationship is inching, beginning to inch nearer to public employment law rules. And that's a big progress. That's a huge progress. Beyond this area that you've talked about, I know that you're an expert in both contracts and labor law. Are there gaps in those areas that you think needs to be addressed? No, they, like when you talk of contracts, it's this issue, issue of freedom of contract, that what you decide is what you, you know, you get what you see because that's what you decided. But the truth of the matter, for example, in the case of a, uh, labor law, that's where the change is very important, is that there's really, in truth, no freedom. I call it Hobson's choice. You're looking at the devil and the deep blue sea. There is no real freedom. One, because of unemployment, a whole lot of activities, individual employer and employee don't get to sit down to determine their terms and conditions. It's only in very few cases. In other areas of the law, it's a question of law on paper and law in action. You know, there are two different things. It's a question of the soul of the law manifesting. You can have, yes, we have law on paper. So what? Like many years ago, when I went to Turin for the first time, the International Labor Organization Training Center, and we had to bring a write-off from our different countries. Uh, the other participant from Nigeria brought his own, saying, oh, we have laws, we have this, we have that. I said, if you open your mouth, I will challenge you. We have the laws, but what effects? It's not about having things on paper. It's about how they've translated into action. I think that's what's beginning to ha happen, for example, with the amendment of uh, uh, constitution that enlarges the jurisdiction of the National Industrial Court. In other areas, if we can allow the spirit of the law to play out, then you will see the results. That's why, going back to the first question he asked, whether law has anything to do. What is the rationale? What mischief are you trying to kill? 
What's the problem? It was because we still haven't even asked. I said, what really is a problem? Like I said, ethnocentricity, a problem. The way I put it, I said, the way we reason, you determine, OK, I'm Igbo. We want Igbo president, whether it's a good or whatever. So long as she be Igbo good, let him be there. We are Yoruba, Yoruba good, let him be the Hausa good. She be Hausa. It should not be. We should be looking for the right person, the right woman, the right man for the job. Where you come from should not matter. But it matters to us. And because of that, merit is subsumed. Law cannot help you to do that. We have to change our minds. Something goes wrong. Mm -hmm.